Okay, so we had finished up with chapter six. How many people went and practiced naming at all? Okay. So some of that stuff, I think the only way you're going to know if you get it or not, meaning I can review it real quick and that might jog your brain enough to put you on the right track, but until you actually go and practice it, you'll never know really if you're getting it because remember, it's always easier to follow along on the board than it is to do it yourself with a blank sheet of paper in front of you. So on some of those topics, really the best way is practice makes perfect, especially when there's a lot of practice available. Okay, so chapter seven was all about conversions between grams and moles and atoms. And really, chapter seven is just kind of a tiny little prequel to chapter nine, meaning in chapter seven, we just did the problems to do them, to convert them. And then in chapter nine, we use those conversions in like real problems. And we've also used them on and off in chapter 15 for doing titrations and sort of all along the way. And you know, you need grams per mole to do uh, colligative properties and things. So hopefully this isn't too bad. What is the conversion factor between grams and moles? Okay, and what's the conversion factor between moles and atoms? Atoms or anything else per mole. And then the only other thing we talked about is if I have a formula like H2SO4, what are some things I can say about it? Like for instance, there's two moles of hydrogen in one mole of H2SO4, right? And there's one mole of sulfur in one mole of H2SO4. And then there's four moles of oxygen is one mole of H2SO4. So we could take apart an actual chemical compound. And we could say the same thing if we wanted to in terms of atoms, meaning we could say there's two atoms of hydrogen in one molecule of H2SO4. And so the ratio is the same. Where we apply it in the problem differs, meaning if you're using the atoms one, you would do it after you use Avogadro's number. If you did it in the moles part, you'd do it you know, when you were at moles in the problem. And so you can say the exact same thing. And then four atoms, oxygen is one molecule of H2SO4. So those are really the three conversion factors that you're going to be using. Your molecular weight conversion factor, Avogadro's number, and then if you need to, the number of atoms or moles in something. Right, because remember, really remember one mole, well, okay, so let's, let's take it step back a step. We know that one dozen has how many atoms in it? Twelve. Twelve atoms. And we know that, say, for instance, a ream of paper is 500 pages. Well, I know these weird conversions for things like that. And what we're really saying is that one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd pages. And so one mole is simply a large number of atoms. So whether I say two moles of hydrogen is one mole of sulfuric acid, or two atoms of hydrogen are one molecule of sulfuric acid, are really kind of the same thing. The only, way, the only thing with the mole is, is I'm really saying there's a whole shit ton of of hydrogen in a whole shit ton of H2SO4, meaning there's a lot of hydrogen in a mole of H2SO4. But the ratio part, that two to one, is still the same. It's two to one, the ratio? Yeah. So remember, moles are just a fancy way of saying the number of atoms. So it, it's kind of like an upscaling thing where, you know, we might say that one molecule of A reacts with one molecule of B. Well, it's the same thing as saying a dozen A's react with a dozen B's. Or the same thing as saying one mole reacts with one mole. It's just oh, literally okay. a number. And so like for instance, when we were talking about colligative properties in chapter 15, the reason we measured the moles of solute was because we said the colligative properties were proportional to the number of atoms or the amount dissolved in it. And so we could have calculated in terms of atoms. But again, there's a lot of atoms in any sample of anything we deal with. That's why we abstract it to a mole. It's like in baking, you can count the number of flour molecules in a cup of flour, or you can measure out a cup of flour. Which one's easier? Probably measuring a cup of flour. Same thing with atoms. We can talk about everything as one atom plus one atom, or we can say it's a mole plus a mole. So let's just do some quick examples. Say I have 
grams of NaOH, and I want to convert that to moles of NaOH. So remember, we only have two conversion factors to pick from in this chapter, really, maybe three if we consider the mole to mole one. And so we know that to go from grams to moles, we simply use molecular weight. And so maybe this is a too easy of an example. And then NaOH is what, 23 plus 16 plus 1, it's about 40. And so we would just take 24.5 divided by 40. And then the thing you have to remember is keep track of your significant figures. So how many sig figs should my answer have? Yeah, so it's 0.613 moles of NaOH. Or if I say that I have 5.8 times 10 to the 26 mole or uh, atoms of uh, sodium, and I want to know how many grams of sodium. And so here, remember, there's no direct atoms to grams one. This is where you have to go through that intermediary of a mole. We know there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole of Na. And then we know that one mole of Na is about 23.99 grams, wait, 22.99 grams of Na. And so if we plug that into our calculator, probably the part that you have to make sure you remember the best, the most, is simply how to type in all those big exponents. So make sure that you kind of refresh your brain with your calculator. And I get that this is 22149.83, blah, blah, blah. But I should only have two sig figs, so I'm going to say that's either 22,000. Oops. I got an extra mark there. Grams of sodium. Or it's 2.2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4 grams of sodium. And it's a positive exponent in this case because it is a big number. Every time I see Jess wearing the shirt that says Jay's Sporting Goods, I'm like, that, never mind, that's not mine. Oh. <laughs> okay, so th that's the grams and moles and moles and grams and atoms. Oh, there's naked Jay big dill liquor. <laughs> The chemistry tree, yes. Someone has shown me the chemistry tree already. So that is good. OK, one last one. How many moles of oxygen are in 245.0 grams of H3PO4? All right, let us figure this one out. We'll take a break because I got to go figure out the molecular weight of H3PO4 anyway. Yeah, I'll figure it out on my own. Uh, I should point out that all of these types of problems, and I don't know if necessarily this last type of problem, but there is extra practice on the web for going between grams, moles, and atoms. Yeah, and I just so. And that's, I, I got to be honest, probably reprinting the homework. I doubt you remember it from the first time through. And there is even an extra homework for this I chapter, too. Campus, so. Well, there you go. So I don't know how much we need to practice on the board versus you guys can practice on your own and just bring your questions. Just make sure that you're kind of doing that practice today and Sunday so you can bring the questions Sunday night or really early Monday morning, I guess. Oh, what is the molecular weight of phosphorus? It's going to differ depending upon which periodic table you're using, probably. And it really depends. I tend to round numbers, especially in my examples, more than I should.
So does everyone have the answer? Yes, no, need another minute. I'm working less on the answers and more on the steps. Make sure I know what I'm doing. So of course we have to start with our 245.0 grams of H3PO4. And we should know the only thing we can ever convert grams into, aside from, say, kilograms or something, is generally moles. So we've got 97.98 grams of H3PO4 is one mole H3PO4. Now, again, remember, if you used a slightly different number because you kept track of sig figs better and you looked on your periodic table more than I did, you might have a slightly different number there. But that's okay for a practice like this. And then we know one mole of H3PO4 has four moles of oxygen. And so I got 2.501 oops, uh, moles of oxygen. If you get a slightly different number, if you got 2.498 or you got 2.503 or something close, those are rounding errors, right? On a test, I just you know, blink that off unless it seems like you're really far off. Or did I forget to multiply by? Let me see. 245 divided by 97.98. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the first step. Times 4, yeah, is 10. Good point. Wow, that's pretty cool that I could magically make it out to be exactly 10.00. That's impressive for randomly guessing numbers. And again, if you have 9.99 or you have 10.01 or you have a sarcastic comment, stuff it. Okay, that's chapter seven in a nutshell. Wait, can you do one that, remember on the test there was one that had like atoms of, oh, so basically you well, have to think. Well, if we just said this, if we replaced this and said how many atoms, then we just have to add one step at the end of this, which is simply one mole of oxygen is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And so if we take okay. 10 times, well, Well, it does. I mean, I'm saying that you're continuing this problem, right? So everything up above is the same. So you would just simply multiply your, your answer by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And so you get 6.02 times 20 to 10 to the 24th atoms. So if you can remember the grams to mole to atoms sort of just that formula, that should be enough to get you most questions in chapter, excuse me, chapter seven. Yeah. Okay, now here's where, in the way things are arranged in your book, chapter eight is next on reactions. And that actually is where we're gonna finish off on the first test. But chapter nine makes more sense to do right after chapter seven, simply because it's grams per mole and stuff. But we'll go in order just to be Just reactions. Literally, the page is complete these 10 reactions. Correct. So stop with chapter 8 for the first part of the final and realize you're just going to have to complete 10 reactions. And of those 10 reactions, we know that in general, they're going to be double displacement, acid base, single displacement, combustion, meaning those four primarily. And there might be one combination or decomposition. So ask yourself, where is the best place to spend your time studying? Probably the four main reactions and blow off the one that you might get wrong. Except for we had a lot of We didn't have a lot of examples of combinations. That was the whole point. That's why I'm saying we. But I don't want to get one wrong. Oh, okay. Well, I, I will still review it. I'm just saying if you're focusing your studying. What did you say, Jess? Well, that's why I listed it as the four that are the most common ones, right? So we'll cover all of them. I'm just saying that if you're.
focusing your studying, focus on the big things. I mean, if I was memorizing scientists, probably the last scientist I would remember is, say, Goldstein. Or Simply be, Stoney. Or Stoney. Stoney. Actually, Goldstein's probably the important <laughs> one. But Stoney or something, you know, the minor scientists. If I was going to really focus on one, I'd probably say, yeah, Priestley. You know, we even skipped him just because we don't care. Yeah. And so, you know, focus on Thompson, focus on Rutherford. Those are probably the two that will get you the most. Some of the others might prop up, but hopefully you would have that nice word recognition in your head from doing it. You could certainly have to draw things because I like pictures. They're worth a thousand words. Okay, so let's take a look at each of the four types of reactions. First off, how do you tell what type of reaction? I'm going to leave a lot of the practice and the quizzing for you guys to do since you have tests, you have extra practice sheets for reactions, you have the web, and we're going to focus on more ideas here. And then what I would say is practice this stuff. If you find you're not getting it, that's on chap then on Sunday night we can go over it in either more detail or, you know, put question practice questions up. But you've got so much material. And actually I forgot to mention in class, but uh, Aaron asked me to post all the old tests. So if you yeah. want to print off blank copies of your old tests, you should have most of an answer key down and be able to test yourself with that. So you've got at least three sources of most types of questions. So probably don't need to quiz you in class too much. So for the web, do you have like one where they're all mixed together so you don't have to determine? The reactions? The reactions. The, okay. There is a worksheet, but there's not like completed on the web. But there is like downloadable worksheet that you can do. Right, there's, there's one homework one where you mixed it up, there was an extra credit one where you mixed it up, not really extra credit, extra oh, practice. Win, but they're extra, credit. extra practice, <laughs> and there's the test. So that's three pla places you can practice it all mixed up. Okay. So how can we tell what type of reaction? How do I tell the difference between, you know, all of the different reaction types? That's... Well, it's compound plus a compound. There's no elements involved, right? Yeah, but they go to they Right, single displacement is an... Right, so, we're, so you're going beyond the question, which is simply how do I tell what reaction it is first? Because if you can't tell what to do, then, well, you're stuck right there. So basically, if you see a compound plus a compound, automatically think double displacement. If you see an element plus a compound, you're automatically thinking... Single displacement. What about acid base? Yeah, if you see something that starts with H and something that ends in OH, or really if you recognize an acid plus a base, which is, since you're supposed to memorize them, figure I'm going to put the acids and bases that you memorized on the test, not some random acid that I just find on the internet or something. Jess? Single displacement is with the electronegativity, right? No. Is that the activity series, yes. And then come. What did you say? Does it have to do with electronegativity? There is. No. It, it really, I mean, there is a small correspondence between elements that are electronegative and how, what their reactivities are, but it's not. Easy. The activity series is just their reactivity. Right. Which one's more reactive? Yeah, if there's any link that you would want to draw, it's between reaction potentials which, and electrochemistry, which you guys don't cover. Meaning there is a direct relationship there. Jess? So if the element is the higher reactive, okay, so it switches, right? Yes. So the idea is we're just recognizing now, guess what my next column is? Yeah, so I applaud everyone going ahead and saying what we do, but let's try to stay on task, which is figuring out how to first recognize them and then worrying about what to do. Erin. Um, You're killing me. <laughs> yes, it has plus heat. <laughs> yes. So combustion is always something plus O2 gas. 
And this is generally something composed in our class of just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in some ratio. Okay, so for the what I do people and the people that are jumping way ahead of us, for double displacements, we swap the cations, right? And remember, we swap one copy of the cation because a later step is to balance the charges. For single displacement, we have to choose to swap either a cation or anion, and then we also need to check our activity series. For acids and bases, we know they always occur. And so we swap the cations and add plus heat. And then for combustion, it's always the same. We always make CO2 gas plus H2O gas plus heat. And so sometimes, but remember, there's tricks we've learned. It's e the, front, the, the number in front of the first compound is always a one or a two, basically. And so if you end up with an odd number or you end up with something that looks like it's going to be a fraction, simply multiply everything by two, and that'll probably solve the problem 99.9% .9 of the time. And figure that Jay's unlikely on the test to throw on a question that's combustion that includes the other 0.1% of the time. Remember, I, I don't, I'm not going to say I cherry pick the easiest questions to put on the test, but I certainly try to get rid of all of the most difficult ones, meaning I don't try to throw any surprises at you. I'm not going to throw some weird combustion at you where the coefficients to balance that are 8 plus 9 plus 7 plus something else, you know. I'm going to try to keep it pretty low, nice, easy numbers so you can count on your fingers and maybe toes occasionally. Okay, so we have what do I do, and then maybe we have to ask, or I always like to add that miscellaneous category. Here we have to check to see if we have a change in state, meaning at some point in the reaction we have to produce either a gas or a solid. For single displacements, we already ch said check the activity series. Uh, for acid bases, we always know and occur and we have to put heat. And for combustion, we always have plus heat also. So if it now changes state, also H2O is not aqueous, it's liquid, right? That's different. H2O is generally written as a liquid because when, okay, so we should also put if we form H2O, we know our reaction forms. And we re the reason we write it as a liquid is everything else is dissolved in water, right? So the definition of aqueous is dissolved in water. One of the things we always have to recognize is we don't write water in a reaction very often as a reactant, but everything we do is in water 99% of the time, right? And so it's always there. Okay. And, but if it is a product, we have to write it down because we know that things that form water, it's a small stable molecule, they almost always occur. Does that apply to every one of those or just? Yes, if you form water as a product, we said that that is one of the signs that a reaction occurs. We said signs that a reaction occurs are change in state temperature, meaning XO or endo. And of course, we don't know how to, at least on a piece of paper, and since this is a paper test instead of being in the lab, really the only ones we can recognize are those exothermic ones, right? Meaning it's possible to write reactions that you guys might say nothing occurs where it really does happen, but we just don't have the tools to do it. Uh, what else did we say is a sign that a reaction occurs? Form H2O and certainly color change, but that was only, again, in lab, so really we can't use that very well in, you know, on paper. Jess? You want us to write down Always and always. States for everything. We've always written states from day one in class. I'm trying to think, is there a time when we did not write states? Nope. Oh. Yeah, I don't think before we were doing reactions we were doing states. Well, we didn't do reactions before we did reactions, really. So you know oh, yeah, but we just didn't put the state of things we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well once we learned the states, we've always done states. Right. So since chapter eight you've always put states in. Yeah, and we didn't have but more than three reactions before chapter eight. 
Okay, now I'm going to add these last two because you wanted them. How can I tell a combination? Two reactions, two reactants go to one product. And the reason I don't tend to put combination reactions on there is combination reactions can be double dis look like double displacements. They can look right. like uh, all of the other three types of reactions, essentially. And so one of the reasons I don't tend to put combinations on tests where you at least have to fill in the product side is because it's hard. Now what I will do is ask questions like this, you know, to some, to some oh, molecule. Right. Meaning generally we do the combinations backwards. And the decomposition ones, Taylor's right, is that we have one reactant that has to break apart into two products. And that's the one where we generally remove a small stable molecule. Hmm? Yeah, and there was three that we were supposed to remember that, I don't know, I guess I should just put them up here for SO3. And they all break down into water plus something. You know, CO2 gas, SO2 gas, and NH3 gas. And those were the three decompositions. And really, we tended to see them more as on the product side of our double displacement reactions than we ever did on our other parts, right? Meaning, I could put just straight up, say, okay, here's the decomposition, or I could include it as part of another reaction, which is generally where it showed up. Because again, on the test, we don't tend to have too many decomposition reactions because I got to admit, they're kind of tricky and hard. And there's also usually about more than one, there's usually more than one right answer, so that makes grading it that much harder too. Okay, the other thing we have to remember is sort of what our steps are. So we said that we always want to ID the reaction type. And then the order changed a little bit. We either did the reaction. Or if it's a single displacement, we immediately said, well, you can just check your activity series to see if we even have to do it. And then we remembered to um, balance charges. We had to remember to check our diatomics. We had to add states at some point. And again, for some reactions, you can go way back up here and add the states in here to decide whether you should do the reaction or not. And then the last step was to balance the reaction. And so depending upon the reaction type, which of those steps you do and sort of what order you do them in sort of changes. Because it's easy to check if you do the reaction here for single displacements and that and actually you can do that um, you know up above right here so let's look at some examples uh, let's see So there's five reactions. And it's up to you how you would want to approach these, meaning are you going to do them all at once? Are you going to go through and identify what type of reaction they are and do all the double displacements first and then do all the single displacements? 
Are you going to just have your brain flip flop back and forth? I still think it's useful to say what type of reactions they are. You know, for instance, that's got an element, so it's single displacement. AgNO3 and BaCl2, that has to be a double displacement because it's just uh, compounds plus compounds. This one, because it's a single element, has to be a single displacement. This one we should recognize as an acid and a base because we've got our H and our OH. And then our last one is a combustion reaction that we squeeze down there in the bottom of the page. And then for the single displacement one, the very first thing you should ask yourself is simply, did it occur? No. So which one is more reactive, AG or hydrogen? And hydrogen is more reactive. So that means that hydrogen wants to be in the compound. Therefore, no reaction occurs because it's happy. So we see that and we go, yay, less work. Um, can't you figure out if there's going to be a reaction between the states? Like, yeah. Yes, but in this case, if you did the reaction and you would notice that there is a change in state because we would form uh, hydrogen gas if we did the reaction, but that doesn't mean a reaction occurs for single displacements. For single displacements, the only thing that determines it is that activity series. So you can have a single displacement where no changes of state occur. It's pretty rare. But you can also have a single displacement that no reaction occurs even though it looks like a change in state should occur. For double displacements, we swap. So I swap AgCl and I get BaNO3. And you can even ask yourself right now, before you do any other work, does a reaction occur or not? Because you can go and look up the states. Barium nitrate should be aqueous, and silver chloride should be a solid. So now that you know the reaction occurs, now you can go and finish everything off, which is, again, balance the charges. And so we need to balance the BaNO3. Oh, sorry, yeah. See, I was saying NO3 as I wrote it, and I wrote a 3. Good call. And then after we balance the charges, we should look for diatomics. There's none. And after that, we should balance the reaction. So we should say, well, it looks like since I need two NO3s, I need to have two of these, and I need to have two of the AgCls. Okay, we've got another single displacement. So again, check the activity series. So what I'm comparing is what? Chlorine, in this case, versus fluorine, right? Because this is normally an anion, and so I should compare it to something that's normally an anion. What's more reactive, fluorine or chlorine? What? And so this is, again, another example of no reaction. And acids and bases we know always occur, so we just say I'm automatically going to swap my cations and anions. I get water and I get AlC2H3O2 and plus heat, so I can just automatically know. We know water's a liquid. Aluminum acetate, I'm going to guess it's a aqueous, but it might be a solid, so I'll look it up on the chart. It is aqueous. And so we know the reaction occurs for kind of three different reasons. First off, we know all acid-base reactions occur. Second off, we form water. And third off, we know we form heat for an acid base. Uh, we have to balance charges after we know, after we do that. So here's a plus three and a minus one. And water is nice. It's pre-balanced. So I need three acetates. And so that means I'm going to need three acetic acid molecules. And that's going to mean I make three water molecules. So we balance the reaction too. And I know I can go through this much faster than you know, potentially you guys can keep up. That's why I always say it's easy to follow on the board, especially if you know, I'm balancing something. You're like, oh yeah, that's really obvious that that's the way it goes. So practice. Go ahead and you know, pull out that reaction sheet and practice on it and see you know, what works and where you get stuck so that you can ask questions on Sunday night. The last one we recognize is combustion because of the O2. We know that that automatically makes CO2 plus H2O plus heat. We can put the states in even. And here, when we're balancing it, 
I usually start with the carbons. I've got one and one. Uh, the hydrogens, I've got four on one side, so I need a 2O over here. For oxygens, then that's one, two, three, four, so I need a two here. And I picked a, you know, randomly picked a nice, easy combustion reaction to balance. It comes out nicely. Yes. Then we would write no reaction. Five what? One, two, three, four. And there's, oh, you're right, there is one. Oh, this is a harder one. Good job, Brittany. So there really is, since there's one here and we've got three on one side and four on the other, this is a hard one to balance. So what's the easy thing to do if it's hard to balance? Yeah, I just go two and two for my carbon. So now I've got eight hydrogens, so I need four here, right? So now I've got four oxygens, eight oxygens, but I've got two on there, so three. Good job, Brittany. Jay's... Also, have you shown the gas up there? For combustion? Is it a gas? You shown the gas? Generally, in a combustion reaction, remember there's so much heat generated that almost always the water that would be normally a liquid is turned completely to a gas. Now, if we ever do, well, when we look at combustion reactions more in second semester, what you'll find is that when you do the combustion reactions, sometimes the combustion produces water and sometimes it, and, it, and sometimes it produces the gas. And so, you know, if you're writing based on observations, you should write, you know, liquid or gas depending upon what you visually see. But realize that most often we see it turn straight to a gas. Like if you have a bonfire, do you see it raining? No. You see the, the, all the water is in the gaseous state. I should, but I probably would be grading it so fast so that I can go home and have a fun that I probably wouldn't notice. Okay, that's reactions. We can do a bunch more, but again, unless you guys are practicing them on your own, you're not getting anywhere. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest we cover chapter 9, since we have the time before noon, and it's going to be on the second part of the final, but really what I would suggest on, now I don't know, you guys have two finals on Monday already, or? Yeah. Some of you do? And so it's going to be tight. You're going to have to do some of your studying for the second half of the chemistry final on that day. I thought about putting the chemistry final on Wednesday at some random time, but yeah, so I don't think it really makes a difference what day I put it on. It's going to suck. So what I'm going to suggest is we're going to go through a review of 9 and 10 for sure and 11. What's 10? 10 was all the scientists again in quantum mechanics. But again, we're going to just, you know, one name, one part, right? And then the other thing I would, so I would suggest, you know, we'll cover 9, 10, and 11. And then 13 through 16 should be kind of fresh in your head, hopefully. But, you know, go through your tests and see which parts kind of confused you. And then remember, we'll have a study session Monday night, but you should practice sometime, hopefully, Monday afternoon before we do the study session so that you can come and say, okay, these are the things that when I was practicing them on the worksheets or homework or something, I kept getting wrong. Instead of covering it and then going home and practicing Monday night and getting yourself confused and, you know, I don't know, the, the, the finals at Tuesday afternoon. Do you guys have anything Tuesday morning for finals? Well, Anyway, uh, as far as mon or Tuesday morning goes, since your final isn't until 1 o'clock, I've got one other final from 8 to 10, but you, know, you can come in and ask a few questions as long as we're quiet about it, because it's only three people taking the test. If they show up. Well, it's a final. They probably will show up. Not guaranteed. But 
also, I would have from 10 to 12 free, or 10 to 12-ish free. And so if people wanted to come in before the final and get a few last minute questions in and examples and stuff done. Aaron. So when we study the scientists, should we study from the grade that we just did, or should we still have that background knowledge of all the... I would say the review we just did, because we said we're only gonna pick the single most important thing for each scientist. Okay. And so really at that point, it is just memorize one fact about each scientist. Yeah, we'll go through those here in a minute. Now, again, I also said there's some scientists that you should know more about Thompson and uh, Rutherford. Same thing with this next chapter. There's some scientists you should know more about. OK, so let's look at chapter 9. Chapter 9 was all about this little spreadsheet, where we had a reaction, and we know that we go from grams of A to moles of A to moles of B to grams of B, or that really we could also start from milliliters and we could go to milliliters if we wanted to. But that that was essentially the overall process for most of the problems. And then the conversion factors we had to remember are molarity, molecular weight, mole to mole, molarity, and molecular weight. And I, I would think that most of this is still fresh in your brain, especially the molarity ones since they're in Chapter 15. Everyone seemed to do just fine on the Chapter 15 homework. And the question on the test, I think almost everyone got it. Uh, there were some little minor difficulties with keeping track of things. But you know, overall, I would say people got it. And then the other things we had to remember are things like limiting reactant. And so if I'm given two reactants, what that means is I have to take grams of reactant one and grams of reactant two and convert them both to grams of one of the products. And it doesn't have to be product one. I guess I'll put a question mark here what product you convert it to, right? And the one that produces the least amount is what we termed our limiting reactant. And it meant that we basically had zero left at the end of the reaction. This is the one that was like cooking too, right? Yes, this is all about cooking too. And then the other thing we had on it is if we had to find our excess reactant, we still had to do the first step, but now what we did is we took grams of reactant one and we converted to grams of reactant two and we took out how much we started of reactant two or I guess we should say, let's do it this way. We took grams of our limiting reactant and converted it to grams of our excess reactant. We can't say that reactant one is our limiting reactant per se. And so we took what value we started with with our excess reactant. We subtracted off how much we use of our excess reactant. And that was then how much was left of the excess reactant. And so we had to throw that last little step on where we found that. And then we also had percent yield, which was grams of our product all over the theory, meaning that part had to be given to you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It is actual divided by theory times 100. And what's given to you is this is something that has to be given. And that, that theory is simply that step of calculation from your limiting reactant. So it's limiting Well, no, it's not the limiting reactant. It's the pro amount of product you made from your limiting reactant. And then the last one we threw on here is simply we also asked, you know, how much heat or how much energy. And that was simply, again, going from your grams of your limiting reactant to heat. And we'll go through and we'll do an example of this. But on the homework, there was one problem that I considered the summation problem for that chapter. And then on the test, you'll notice there was one big problem that took up the whole page. Figure that that's exactly what the final looks like. So if you can do the one on the homework, you can do the one on the test, then you can do the one on the final. If you can't do those, then come ask questions. So let's look at it. Given the reaction, um, 
of 25 grams of potassium iodide plus 8.0 grams of barium. I better make sure something actually occurs in my reaction. Nope, that's not a good one. Um, of lead to chloride. We want to answer the following questions. A, um, type of reaction. We'll answer, you know, we'll write the reaction. We want to know um, what is the limiting reactant. We want to know uh, how much excess reactant is left. We want to know how, what is the yield of the solid product. We want to know that if I made 2.6 grams of product of solid, what is the percent yield? And we can say how much heat is generated if one mole of solid product produces 25 kilojoules of heat. Now, will I ask all seven parts in this? Probably not. But for instance, even if I only ask part five, you have to do parts one, two, and three anyway. And so you're probably going to have to do all seven steps at some point, or at least the majority of those steps anyway. And I would say that this is almost verbatim what's going to be on the test, except for the fact that it won't probably be this reaction. I, since I don't have the test in front of me, it could be this reaction for all I know, but I doubt it. So what's question one? What type of reaction is it? Yeah. And then reaction two, we have to write it so we know that it's potassium iodide plus lead to chloride. And I think lead to chloride is actually a solid, but it doesn't really matter on that side. Yeah, it's a solid. And since it's a double displacement, we're going to form KCl, which I know is aqueous plus some PBI2, which is a solid. And then if we balance it, we should notice that we need two potassium iodides and we make two potassium chlorides. And of course, I'm going to have to go back and forth because I forget what the questions are. We had 25 grams of this and we had 8.0 grams of lead to chloride. And so we need to do a limiting reactant calculation. So step three is find limiting reactant. So we know that we're going to start with both of our reactants, 25 grams of Ki. And we know grams of Ki, oops, grams of Ki is one mole of Ki. We know that two moles of Ki produce one mole of PBI2. Now, why did I choose PBI2? Because the next couple questions ask how, many sol how much of the solid I make, right? So I might as well use that as my, in my limiting reacting calculation since I need to answer that question later. And we know that one mole of PBI2 
is so many grams of PBI2. And we'll have to look up these molecular weights in a second. And then the other reaction is we take 8.5 grams of lead chloride. And we do the exact same thing, except obviously we have a different mole to mole ratio and different molecular weights. But it's the same general process, meaning we're going from grams to moles to moles to grams. Oops, Cl2. We know that one mole PbCl2 is one mole of PbI2. I'm going to do some molecular weights. So let's see. Potassium is 39 plus iodine is 127. I'm rounding these numbers pretty good. So you guys probably have a few more sig figs in there. And PbI2 is... 127 times 2 plus lead, which is 207. So that's 461. And then we need PbCl2, so 35.45 times 2 plus 207. We'll round this one to 278. And then this is still 461. So if we're doing the math, we've got 25 times 461 divided by 166 divided by 2. I should make 34.71 grams of PBI2. And here, 8.5 times 461 divided by 278 is 14. 1 0 grams of PBI2. And really, the reason I kept more decimals is that this is going to be 35 if we keep track of sig figs, and that'll be 14 if we keep track of sig figs. But if the two numbers were really close to each other, I wanted to have a few extra decimals to check. Oh, well, here, we'll just cheat. It's easier to change it there than to redo all the math. Aaron, you're seeing things again. That clearly says 8.5. So what's my limiting reactant? What's the actual answer to question three? Yeah, so here's my actual limiting reactant, because that produced the least amount of the product. And then what was question four? How much of the excess reactant is left, right? So for the excess reactant, remember, we want to take grams of our limiting reactant and convert it to grams of our excess reactant. So we start with our 8.5 grams of PbCl2, one mole of PbCl2, one mole PbCl2 is two moles Ki. One mole Ki is grams of Ki. This is grams of PbCl2. So again, notice I went from grams to moles to, mol to grams, meaning it's just that beginning chart on chapter 9. And then for the molecular weights, what do we got? 278 and 166. So notice this is just molecular weight, mole to mole, molecular weight. We just keep doing that over and over and over again. It's just the only difference is what molecular weights we're using, what mole to mole ratio we use from the reaction, and what we're converting from and to. So let's see, 8.5 times 2 times 166 divided by 278 is 10 point grams of Ki used. Therefore, if I take the 25.0 grams I start with, I subtract off 10 grams that I use, that means I have 15 grams left over. And so my actual answer is the 15 grams part, because that's the amount that's left over, not the amount that I calculate using the bar problem. 
this ring a bell to people or not? I mean, I know for me all this rings a bell because I've done it now for like eight, nine, ten, whatever number of years in a row. But uh, hopefully when you're studying for the final, you're, everything you look at is like, yeah, I, I pretty much, I kind of remember that. Or, you know, I've got most of the basics down. I need to brush up on it. And you'll be surprised at what you actually have learned and remembered in this class. I think the things that you do, the naming, the reactions, the math, is the stuff that sticks with you. I think the stuff that's easier to forget is the reason behind some of this stuff. So that was four. What's number five? Oh, see, we've already done number five, right? So we already know number five is 14 grams of PBI2 because in part three, for the limiting reactant, you get two answers, right? You get both what is the limiting reactant, but you also get how much of the excess reactant, or I'm sorry, how much of the product you make. So we're already done with number five. That was cake. Number six, so in part three, the, we get the limiting reactant, but this is always then the yield of that product. Okay, so whatever the answer is, the limiting reactant yields. For your product. For your solid. Well, if you converted it to your solid. Now, if you had picked and decided in step three to convert to KCL because you didn't read ahead and figure out that you need how much PBI2, well, then you would have to go and do this actual part under the PBI2 section. So it always pays to read a little bit ahead in the question okay. to see which one is the preferred one to convert to. Now, it might ask you simply how much of both you make, in which case you do have to do another question. Cody. Um, slightly off topic for the test. Are you going to split up my chapters and resolve it? It is pretty much in order by chapter. Okay. So you should expect when you sit down that chapter 9 is the first thing staring in the face on part 2. It was, and it'll go chapter 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16. And the reason I do it that way is it's much easier for me to write the test that way than to bother to randomize it. Yeah, actually, well, no, I'm not even, I'm not going to say that. So let's see, in 6, we made 2.6 grams, right? So for part 6, if I made 2.6 grams and my theoretical yield is 14 grams, then we just you know, plug those numbers in. 2.6 divided by 14 is 18, well, 19% if we round up. So unfortunately, we received an F for our percent yield. For our percent yield, we've got an F on this test. Remember, percent yield is just like calculating your grade. You know, this is what you get on the test. This is what, you know, maximum on the test was. And so remember, percents are always just like calculating a grade, basically. So you can do the same thing. Yes, what was seven? Oh, how much energy, right? And one thing we should recognize is we said that there is 25 kilojoules per mole of solid, right? So what we should say here is that this is plus 25 kilojoules, right? Because we had one mole of solid when we balanced it. So then we can just start from our excess reactant, or we can start from our limiting reactant. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, I always like to start from the limiting reactant just because it's the safe place to do it. And so I might say that if I had, what, 8.5 grams of PBCL2, one mole, of PBCL2 is grams of PBCL2. And then instead of a mole to mole ratio, remember what you say is that I've got one mole of PBCL2 is 25 kilojoules. And what is the molecular weight of PBCL2? 278. And so 8.5 times 25 divided by 278 is 0 0.76 kilojoules. So instead of going into mole to mole ratio, you just Yeah, this is my mole to kilojoule ratio. Because heat isn't measured in grams, right? You don't measure heat in moles. You could, but you don't. And so we just have a mole to kilojoule ratio at that point. Because anything that's in that reaction, you can write a ratio for it, remember. That's chapter 9 in a nutshell. 
Now, you, I, well, that, that really is the tail end of it. Notice that, remember when we did the chapter nine homework, we had like six homeworks that built up to this type of question, right? It is easier once you just sit down and look at it and think about it. And it seems like a lot. I think in the beginning, you know, we needed to go through those steps because mole to mole ratios and molecular weights and all that stuff was new. I think the second time through, we can cut right to the end problem and say, all of this should ring a bell, hopefully enough for you to do it. And if it doesn't, then we have to go in and fill in, you know, where we got the mole to mole ratio, where we got the molecular weights and things like that. It is 1114. So chapter 10. We're going to get to as far as we get before noon, because then I'm going to go play racquetball. And if people want, we can schedule a little bit more tonight to finish it up, or we can just finish it up on Sunday night or something. Yeah, like after the basketball game. Although, if I do that after the basketball game, then I don't know when I'm going to bake cookies, but we'll see. I don't know. Maybe I... I all i got to say is, in that new building, I, if I have to purchase it from my own money, I'm just going to put an oven in my office. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 10, again, go through your chapter 10 test. It's going to be mostly the basics that were on chapter 10. Uh, for the scientists, let's just list one thing from them, right? So we started off with Huggins. And really, it's Huygens or whatever, but I like them as Huggins. And what was the other guy? Oh, yeah, Sir Isaac Newton, the cookie guy. And one of them said that light behaved like a wave, and one be said light behaved like a particle. Do you remember who was who? Yeah, wave, light, or particle. And that was the early history. And the one that was most important at that point was people believed the particle model until who? Um, uh, yep. Young and his yeah. double slit. Actually, I shouldn't put an arrow to him. I should put that at this point, young, double slit. And then we also had Maxwell. He had four equations. And now we go on believing light's a wave. And people are pretty solidly convinced that it's a wave because there's things that you can't explain by saying that light is a particle. So we had that sort of back history. And then. What? Yeah, Maxwell just had four equations that basically describe light energy or light electricity and magnetism in, in, for, in terms of waves. And the fact that you could explain this all nicely by four equations, people really liked it because it was nice and relatively easy, other than the fact that the equations themselves were really nasty, ugly math. We do have the Planck well, constant, talk about and we have. Okay, I was going to say, one of the things is, like in my other class, they go through a bunch more of the equations. You guys don't have to know a single equation for this chapter, do you? No. I mean, I might have, I might have an, in the lecture written it down simply so you could see what it looked like, no, but I don't even think I did that. The there you go. So no equations. None. I was just wondering, because I saw on the Not a 9-nil. Yep. Kind of like yep. No, there is the Planck know. equation. In fact, just about everyone actually had an equation that we're talking about that we don't talk about. Okay, so that was sort of that back history, right? And in addition to that back history, kind of feeding into this, we also had the um, line spectra, right? And we attributed, we didn't give a person for line spectra, but what we basically said is that if I have an atom, well, if I have just normal light and I shine it on a prism, I get a rainbow. But if I take light and I have it interact with a bunch of atoms, 
then I get one color. Or I get a series of lines, but I don't get that rainbow. And what really we learned that this implies is that here the electrons are anywhere. Here the electrons are in orbitals, meaning that's the, in, that's the final answer of why a rainbow is not produced, whereas single colors or things like that are produced. Realize we are simplifying this down a whole lot. And in fact, it's not 100% accurate either, but it, it gets us the big picture, I think. So really just remember that line spectra can either produce rainbows, but for atoms, they produce single lines. That's why it's called the line spectrum phenomenon. And that that was the big impetus for going from which two model or which model to which model. So this is all back history right here. And I guess we should also maybe put two more pieces of back history in. We'll, we'll do that because it all kind of goes in here. Um, this is the next page. So it's things that are going towards that next page. And if I'd been thinking about how I was kind of writing this ahead of time, we've also got two more arrows coming in. We said that we have Planck. And he simply said that energy is quantized. And technically, he did the black body radiation theory. So know that Planck, black body radiation, energy is quantized. And we had Einstein. And we had the photoelectric. And he also said that energy is quantized. It's just he was the second person to say it. So we've got all three of these pieces of information feeding into the transition from the Bohr model of the, or I'm sorry, the Rutherford model of the atom to the Bohr model. I know I kind of squeezed it in there, so if you can't read any of those words, I'll rephrase it. It says the photoelectric effect is the experiment he did and energy is quantized. Meaning if you can link up those words, then you should be able to answer any question that's multiple choice about that. Now if I say what are the details of the photoelectric effect, well, I won't do that, right? Meaning I've told you that this is going to be more of a word recognition thing. And it's, I don't know, it's just what it is. In the end, it's going to be a multiple choice question. I know. but. We're trying, to, we're trying to go through this and get done before 12 o'clock. And we probably won't even get to chapter 11. But chapter 11, if you remember right, the majority of it is Lewis structures oh, yeah. and one other thing. And so hopefully people remember Lewis structures. If not, grab your labs and look over that. And you get your model kits also. But we'll also cover it Sunday, too, or after the basketball game. I don't know. We'll see what happens. So the reason all that information is coming in is that we had the Rutherford model. And what he said is that we've got the nucleus, where all the positive charge is, and then the electrons are in a cloud. And we transition from the Rutherford model to the Bohr model, where we still have the positive charge in the middle, but now the electrons are in orbitals. And the reasoning behind that is that here, this predicts a rainbow because the electron can be anywhere. In that cloud, whereas the Bohr model, because the electrons are in orbitals, only specific colors are emitted. And the reason Bohr said the electrons are in orbitals is that he said they're quantized. Or basically he's saying, well, if energy can be quantized in the, in the, uh, by Planck and Einstein, then electrons can be in quantized orbitals. And if you remember right, the flaws that he had is it only worked for one electron. And I shouldn't say it only works for one electron. Theoretically, it works for as many electrons as you have. Mathematically, you can only solve it precisely for one electron. This is flaws for the Bohr. These are flaws for the Bohr model. 
See, the Rutherford's model, his flaw was basically can't explain line spectrum. And then the other, mo the other flaw for the Bohr model is basically no reason for quantization. quantization. So after the Bohr model, who did we have? Yeah, de Broglie. And he said that his most famous quote, and the one that people missed on the test, is that if light can behave like a particle or a wave and a particle. then an electron can behave like a particle and a wave. So what he's basically saying is that if light that we used to think was a wave can behave like a particle, and if then an electron, which we normally think of as a particle, because when Thompson discovered it, it has mass, it casts shadows, you know, it has the properties of a particle, then maybe it can behave like a wave. And that's what we call wave particle duality. And that's what allows us to explain orbitals. Because only a very specific wavelength can fit at a very specific distance. And that was that kind of picture we used there. It's kind of like a, a, a guitar string can only play one note if you just pluck it, right? and that to change the note, you have to change the length of the string. Now, that, that's pushing my musical knowledge. I think that's a true statement, right? Or can you play more than one note? Well, yeah, you move your fingers around on that's, uh, But I just said you change the length of the string by moving your finger on it, right? Oh, okay. Meaning if you just have, right, if you just have a guitar string, you go pluck, and that's the note you get. And then if you want to change that note, you change the length of the guitar string. So the I, yeah, because it can't vibrate under your finger. Now, it does a tiny little bit, but I mean, we're talking a perfect guitar string. Only can have one note. And really, it can have harmonics of that note, but again, let's not worry about the details too much. Okay, after de Broglie, we did have, well, we have, and see, this isn't really a flaw in his model, but his flaw was pointed out by Heisenberg. And the only reason we care about Heisenberg is because we watched Breaking Bad. And if we talk about Heisenberg real quick, all he says is that you can't know both the position and momentum of an electron. Or basically, he says you can't have orbitals. And we won't worry about the reasons. And then the final transition was the Schrodinger. You said that the solution to Heisenberg's thing is to have what he had, is, or he called them wave equations. And these simply describe the probability of an electron. Yeah, and he gave us the shapes. The probability of an electron being in a certain position around an atom, or certain position, or location, maybe is a better word to say. What really happens at this point is we've got the whole idea of quantum mechanics. I mean, that kind of starts with de Broglie and this whole wave-particle duality. And then Heisenberg says that some of the weirdness of quantum mechanics is simply that you can't know both the position and momentum of something. You can't know both parts or both features in a quantum world. In a real world, we can know those pretty well. And then Schrodinger said the way around this is to describe everything statistically and to have a model that talks about the probability of finding an electron in certain spots. And so quantum mechanics quickly gets weird. It's way over our heads. And really, the only reason we want to know it, or at least be aware of it, is that it really is the, the, the most current modern theory that we believe describes you know, an atom. 
and because it allows us to get greater understanding into the periodic table and into you know, the Lewis, uh, the octet rule and various things like that. And so what he did is he proposed that there's s orbitals, there's p orbitals, there's d orbitals, and there's f orbitals. And so s, p, d, and f. And he just said that there are, I'll go to a new page here because otherwise it'll get too crowded. So he said that there's basically four quantum numbers. There's N, L, M sub L, M sub S. And N is the principle. It really is simply the distance from the nucleus. And that's important because we know that this describes the row that we're in. L is the shape. I'm sorry, L is, I guess I should go back. L is the angular momentum because that's how we were doing the order. And that really simply describes the shape of the orbital. And I don't know how better to say this, but it just simply tells us whether we're in the S, P, D, or F, what we learned is blocks on the periodic table, right? Does everyone remember which one is S, P, D, and F? On the periodic table? Yeah. OK. Meaning I can draw, I, I can sketch a periodic table up there. M sub L is the magnetic quantum number. And this described the orientation. Or the reason it's important to us is it tells us that an s orbital has two electrons, p orbitals can have six, d can have 10, or f can have 14. And that's why there's two s columns, six p columns, 10 d columns, and 14 f columns. So each of the quantum numbers describes something else. I'm sorry, I, I, let me go back. I, I kind of skipped a step. There's one s orbital, three p's, five d's, and seven Fs, and this was the electron spin. It basically says that it can either spin up or down, meaning there's two choices. And I'm sorry, but it's the combination of these that tell us that there's a total of two electrons. P has six electrons in it, D has 10 electrons, and F has 14 electrons. So it's the combination of those last two that give us the, how many columns there are. Chapter 10 is a big chapter. It's a bitch. It is. It's a hoe. I used to like it. And then we talked about things like what does 3P5 mean? This simply means that I'm in the third row, right? Or what it means is that N equals 3, and it's the distance. This tells me the shape. So it's telling me I'm in a P orbital, so it's a dumbbell. Uh, it's telling me that, oh, M sub L technically equals 1. I don't know if I really care about that. And this is simply telling me the number of electrons. And that if we had an element that's last electron configuration was 3P5, we would be talking about chlorine. Does that ring a bell? Uh, so like if we wanted to write Chlorine, we'd say it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So you should sort of remember the electron configurations. And then if we drew that in a box diagram, and I'm not going to draw boxes because I'm horrible at boxes, you know, we'd have something like this where 
you'd have electrons with opposite spins. And then the last five electrons are not spinned until, or aligned until we have to and not paired up until we have to. And actually that is about chapter 10 right there. I guess that was the end of chapter 10 was all those electron configurationies. So chapter 11 I'm gonna break into two parts. We'll cover the first part up to Lewis structures and then Lewis structures I'm gonna let you probably have to review on your own and we'll either pick them up, or we'll pick them up tomorrow night probably. So the one thing you have to remember from chapter 11 or the two things is there was, if I draw something like this, what we said is that we can describe it in terms of Lewis structures by saying there's one dot here, there's valence electrons here, and that we'd write it like this. And so the idea here is that you know, no octets. We have complete octets. And that we can also show why molecular compounds, so we can do that or we can say that sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Chlorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p5. That gives one electron from there, so that means sodium plus has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Chlorine ends up with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And again, we go from not octets to complete octets. Yeah, so this is supposed to be Na. This is supposed to be chlorine. This is Na plus, and that's chlorine minus if we were writing it. So the understanding is that we've always said that sodium forms a plus one cation, chlorine always forms a minus one. The reasoning is because that way sodium only has one valent, or since sodium has one valence electron and chlorine has seven, that it's easier to lose one and get an octet and chlorine wants to gain one and get an octet. And so we can explain all of those chemical reactions that we did or with the molecules that we formed in chapter six. And we can also talk about the chemical reactions in chapter seven, balancing charges, all in terms of those valence electrons and octets. And then the other part of chapter 11 that I'm just gonna recommend is rote memorization, meaning uh, again, it's a final exam I'm only picking the highlights, and so I probably won't ask a ton of explain questions, is ionic radius, meaning the trends. So we had ionic radius, we had electronegativity, or not electronegativity, ionization energy, and we had the size of cations and the size of anions. So for ionic radius, we said that down a column, size increases. Across a row, size decreases. We said for ionization energy, the trends are exactly the opposite. Since the molecules, since we're going down a column, the molecules are getting bigger. That means that the ionization energy is getting smaller. And that across a row, since we're decreasing size, ionization energy actually increases. And then size of cations, they get smaller, and anions get bigger than their normal molecules. And then at that point, we were transitioning into things like Lewis structures. 
I know, that was exhausting, wasn't it? Here's my recommendations. For chapter one, just know the differences between solids, liquids, and gases, and compounds, molecules, all of that, right? Chapter two, if you can do conversions, you're set. You can practice that until you puke on the internet. Um, hopefully no one's puking, but. Uh, chapter three was just memorize things that we've asked you to do, like metalloids and stuff from the entire semester. Oh, we skipped chapter four entirely, whoops. Really, the big thing is Q equals MS delta T from chapter four. Honestly, I'll even look on my final and see what else I threw in from chapter four out of curiosity. Well, there was a lot of other stuff, but it's all stuff that I think is, that if I said it, you'd know it. What did you want me to do this still, Brittany? Um, chapter four is really, was that and conservation of mass. It was also physical and chemical changes and stuff, but I'm not gonna put it on the test. I'm just gonna have basically a Q equals MS delta T question or two tops. And I gotta be honest, I could put those in the chapter 13 test and be just as happy, right? Or 14, whichever one that was. Um, chapter five is scientists and models. Chapter s and properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Chapter six is naming. Chapter seven is grams, moles, atoms. Chapter eight is reactions. Chapter nine is the problem we just went through. Chapter 10 has a lot of shit in it. Maybe I should narrow down my scope and tell you more what's gonna be on it. But really, if you master the scientists, the understanding of quantum numbers and the shape of the periodic table, I think that covers chapter 10. I don't know, sometimes it seems like it's very little, and then when I start adding it all together, I'm like, it's an awful lot. But figure if you did well on. <laughs> I, my general theory is that if you kind of did well on the tests, you'll do well on this. And well, I, to a certain extent, there's not, that's not 100% true because a lot of the stuff, since we kept using it, you should.